know popular cultures constructs, informs, and reflects our societies. As such, Borderless Cultures aims to bring together filmmakers and scholars to share films that are otherwise not in wide release to talk about Latinx people and film. We have selected films that tell us something about the U.S. racialization of Latinx peoples, and our goal is to reframe Latinx histories and, by extension, the interlaced histories of indigenous, Asian, Black, and Anglo peoples in what today is the South and West of the United States. Do I open the box? In Texas, we had standards. You can't lynch a, a black person from the same tree that you lynch a brown person. You know, it just, just ain't fitting. I hate being on the road. And here I am a thousand miles from home. As disturbing as this is, I would want someone to bury me. Hello everybody, my name is Emmanuel Ramos Barajas and I am the co-curator of the series. I work as the Media and Communications Coordinator at the Block Museum of Art at Northwestern University. I am also the co-creator and producer of Unsettling Journeys, an educational YouTube channel dedicated to deconstructing Latinx identities through art history. I want to welcome everybody to our first iteration of the Borderless Cultures Film Festival. And I am also very happy to introduce my colleague and collaborator, Assistant Professor in American Studies at UNC Chapel Hill, Annette Rodriguez. Annette received her PhD in American Studies at Brown University and has been teaching at Chapel Hill since she joined the department as the recipient of a Carolina Postdoctoral Fellowship for Faculty Diversity in 2018. Um, as collaborators on opposite coasts, I'm in California, she is in North Carolina. Our festival, Borderless Cultures, is our offering to gather across space, watch movies, and share time and ideas. Um, being a content creator, art educator, and media coordinator at an academic museum, I tackle the narrative and artistic vision of filmic works. Uh, one of the creative works I'm currently developing is set in Alta California in the 19th century. So I'm constantly thinking about the historical narratives presented in mainstream cinema, specifically how Western films present and centers ideas of land, ownership, borders, race, laws, and legality. Likewise, Professor Rodriguez fixates on historical context and the value of scholarly analysis. Her first book in progress is called Inventing the Mexican, the visual culture of lynching at the turn of the 20th century and concentrates on perennial racist violences in the United States as communicating events that construct and reinforce ideologies and hierarchies of race, gender, citizenship, and national belonging. All of this to say that both Annette and I are constantly spending time thinking of the power of images and how they communicate their messages. With that established, I want to introduce our guest today, director John J. Valadez. John is a Peabody Award-winning filmmaker who has written, directed, and produced many nationally broadcast documentary films. He grew up in Seattle, taught photography in India, and studied filmmaking at New York University. He is also the director of the documentary film program at the College of Communication, Arts, and Sciences in Michigan State University. Valadez films tackled diverse subjects such as the false imprisonment of leaders of the Black Panther Party, Latino poets in New York City, gang-involved children in Chicago, the history of affirmative action, segregation in U.S. schools, Latinos in World War, War, World War II, the evolution of Chicano music, Latino civil rights, and the genocide of Native Americans in the Southwest. We have gathered today to discuss his 2016 documentary, The Head of Joaquin Murieta, which is both a personal journey and a crash course on how the history of Mexican and Mexican Americans have been shaped before, during, and after the establishing of an awesome thing. And I mean this in the words original meaning of something that is extremely daunting or inspiring great apprehension and fear. I'm talking, of course, about the US-Mexico border. Without further ado, I want to allow Annette to talk and set up the documentary in her usual and eloquent and powerful words. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so happy to, to be here with, with you all. I, I want to first thank Emmanuel, our Master of Ceremonies. I want to thank uh, Corbin Davis for 
able assistance and tech abilities. Uh, and I want to talk, uh, thank the Critical Ethnic Studies Collective and the Humanities for the Public Good Initiative at UNC Chapel Hill for their support. Um, so welcome everyone in Cyberlandia. I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, I'll have a few comments on the film to start us out and then we'll move into the conversation with, with our guest and filmmaker. So I, I wanna say, as you all have watched this film, um, you will agree there's so much to admire about this film that does a tremendous amount of work in 30 minutes. Uh, I'm really intrigued by the first abandoned quest that John mentions early on, because this film is a tracing of the second quest that, with the head in the jar. Um, but, but John begins by talking about the first quest that had happened 10 years previous, which was, uh, pun intended, a dead end. Um, the, the film here that we're watching um, depicts the involuntary quest. Um, the involuntary quest prompted by an unknown stranger, prompted by a package postmarked California and received by, by John, the filmmaker. And in some ways, maybe I'm intrigued by this involuntary journey because for me, it's sort of parallel to being Mexican-American or, or Mexican or, or marginalized in the United States, this series of involuntary quests that return us to our own history. And at the beginning of the film, we have John being the only Mexican kid in school subjected to racial epithets. Um, and as this is being recalled, there's this connection with Joaquin Murrieta. John explains that Joaquin Murrieta, quote, embodied our own troubled history in talking about his own family. So, so John, I get the sense of you being haunted not only by Joaquin Murrieta, but also of, of being haunted by your family's own history and your own lived experience. And one of the things I so admire about this film is that in the introduction, you talk about Murrieta as a freedom fighter who defended our land and people. Um, and a remarkable thing you don't do that many uh, lynching scholars do is that you don't repeat and you don't replay the lives of his, the lies of his attackers. So you don't give us a list of things he was accused of. You don't give us all the pretenses that were invented to go after Mexican men and Mexican communities. Instead, you start your tale informing us about how Joaquin Murrieta was a freedom fighter who defended our land and people. And this for me was just one of the most narratively important. It's this remarkable narrative intervention that your film does. And this is something you follow up with when you talk to um, Chicano activist, um, Carlos Cantillo, when you are in Goliad County and you're being introduced to the lynching tree and the whipping post. And Cantillo says, these things existed to punish, quote, transgressions against the social order, end quote. In other words, these things do not exist for crime and punishment. Cantillo says it best. The object of it was to instill terror in their lives. And so in addition to refusing the lie, of lynching as punishment for perceived crimes, your film is also a full rewriting and reframing of history in seven minutes. Um, so, so this is it, this is really remarkable. So it includes discussing Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, Stephen F. Austin, the Alamo, all the time emphasizing a phrase that's so critical: Mexican Texas because so many people speak ahistorically about Northern Mexico and they call it Texas, as though it always and ever was Texas, as though it was predestined to become Texas, even though the, the social and political space they're talking about is Coahuila y Texas, a Northern Mexican state that white colonists were immigrating into. And so in, in, in an early seven minutes of your film, you tell us that while Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, Stephen F. Austin became folk heroes, they were slavers. They owned slaves. You explained that Austin, quote, did more than anyone else 
to move and establish slavery in Texas. And you talk about the Alamo, at the end you declare these men, quote, died so Anglos would be free to own slaves and to take Mexican land, end quote. So this is a critical, truthful retelling of history. And you do it again when you tell the story of Joaquin Murrieta. You explain how the California Rangers were bounty hunters. You never refer to them as militia or as law enforcement or even as extra legal mobs. You tell us they were bounty hunters who were rewarded with cash or heads trophy hunters who displayed the remains of, of a human they decapitated. And you tell us that the effect of this was Latino families fleeing in terror, which of course effectuates the taking of the land. And so this all reminds me of a theorist who writes about the violence that accomplishes colonialism, Sylvia Winter. And she tells us that this violence, quote, set the terms of the exchange. And this is also what you're showing us so powerfully in this film, um, better than I could do in a semester or in a 200 page book. Uh, further, you, you graphically trace the Mexican lynchings, the lynching of Mexicans in the US. And as you do it, you use the word murder. And again, this is, this is undoing that ridiculous inverted narrative we often get about lynching where someone might ask, well, what did he do? Right? What were they punishing him for? What was he accused of? No, you tell us repeatedly and clearly this is murder. And finally, I have to say, I was so pleased to see my colleague, um, Dr. Dulcinea Lara um, as our sort of Henry Louis Gates in the film. Um, giving us this great genealogical turn. And you include Dr. Lara um, digging, bad pun, digging into your genealogy um, and the murder of your great grandfather, which led to your family's loss of land. But she goes back even further and she finds your great, great, great grandfather, Juan Jose Apadaca. And this provides a twist. Um, and this is a twist not only to your personal story, it's a twist to Chicano and Latinx scholarship, it's a twist to land grant studies, it's a twist to the way we might understand ourselves. And so I hope we'll get to talk about that twist as we talk about your, your truly remarkable work. I, I really want to thank you, John, for, for giving us access to your film and to your time in this most uh, demanding moment. Thank you. Wow, that was really good. I, you know, I can just sit. <laughs> I did that? <laughs> you did all of, yes, in 30 minutes, which was like the, the, the sort of, you know, moment of it. It's just sort of like, oh, I can't do this in, in three semesters. Yeah. Mm. Yes, John, welcome to, to this conversation. And thank you so much for your time. I told everybody that Annette would be very eloquent. Mm. Um, so I hope she keeps jumping in and, and bringing in her viewpoint in, in our conversation. So we're going to move forward in, in a type of conversation discussion. And I want to invite all of the participants and audience to send your questions here through the chat. We'll be reading them as they come. So. Um, we had some questions from students uh, from Annette, and I think this is a perfect place to begin, which is what inspired or why were you inspired to go on the quest for the head of Joaquin Murrieta? Hmm. Well, um, I had read uh, Richard Rodriguez's book. Hmm. Uh, um, and uh, there was a there was a uh, you know a chapter uh, that was called I think it was called the head of Joaquin Morieta right and um, you know I read that and I was like hmm I don't know so I so I so I got a hold of Richard I threw a friend of a friend he was living in San Francisco at the time and uh, and so I you know told him hey listen I'm going to be in San Francisco uh, do you want to go out to lunch, man. 
he's like, okay, whatever. And I went over to his place and, you know, I mean, I wasn't in San Francisco. I just said I was going to be there. And once he said, okay, then I flew out. <laughs> you just made it seem casual. I was desperate, you know. Um, so anyway, so I, so, I, so I met Richard. And for those who don't know him, he's a very accomplished uh, writer. Um, you know, he's his own guy. He has his own voice, his own take on things. And he's very, really fascinating guy. A lot of people, you know, hate his guts. Um, a lot of people love him. And, you know, I'm somewhere in the middle. You know, I really appreciate that. And um, anyway, so he told me that, yeah, everything was true. He had gone with this other guy uh, who was a professor at the University of San Francisco, a guy, a guy named Father Alberto Huerta. And they'd gone up to Northern California and they visited this guy who claimed to have the head of Joaquin Murrieta. And they saw the, the head, in quotes. And, um, and, you know, they were appalled and shocked. And so, um, so I asked Richard for Father Huerta's number. And I went over to the University of San Francisco. I met with him. And then he gave me the address of the guy. I don't even remember the guy's name at this point. And I went up there and the guy said that he didn't have it anymore, that he'd gotten in trouble because of that article and that he had gotten rid of it. And I just told him, I was like, come on, man, you have the head. Come on, you Come on. I'm not gonna rat you out. Don't worry about it, you know. Um, and he was like, "No." And I was like, I, "Okay, I'll tell you what. I'll give you a thousand dollars. You let me see the hat." Mm. Which was off. I didn't have a thousand dollars, but anyway. But he said no, and I was like, "Okay, well, whatever." And I gave him my card, and I was like, "Listen, if ever, anything ever happens to change the situation, let me know because I would love to make a film, you know." But I thought. No head, no film. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. That's the hook. That's what people want to see. People are, you know, they're twisted. There's a severed head in the jar. They want to see the severed head in the jar. Without that, you really don't have a film. So um, I don't know. I, so I just never pursued it. I just thought it was, uh, you know, wasn't going to happen. Yeah. And then you did get it. Does that answer your question? And then, and then, of course, what, what, what happened is that, you know, out of the blue, like I'd moved on with my life. I was doing other things, you know, and sort of out of the blue, uh, you know, this occurs. And then I was like, on the one hand, I was like, yes. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, I was like, oh God, this is horrible. Do I really want to do yeah. this? I mean, you know, it's like, this is so like profane. It's so yeah. kind of like disgusting and like, you know, my wife, you know, wasn't having any of it. She's like, mm -hmm. listen, you know, you got to get the hell out of here with that thing. I'm not having yeah. that. You know, so, uh, you know, hence, then I was in a dilemma. I was like, well, what do I, how, what, what film do I make? And how do, what do I do with this thing? Mm -hmm. so my first instinct was, I'll bring it out to California and bury it because it's like a ghost that haunts the American psyche. Yeah. It's, it's the ghost of all of the, all of those who died and names are unknown. And so then I thought, well, you know what? I'll go do that. And then I was about ready to buy the ticket because I was going to fly out there. And I was like, I can't take this through security yeah. on the plane. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then I'll say, what? I'll say, no, I'm going to go bury it. I'm a filmmaker. And they're going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, uh, here, uh, we got this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He's got a severed head, you know, so it's not going to, uh, it's not going to work in my favor. So. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I, I think that's really powerful because as a director, as a creator, you feel like you have to do something with this. You know, you could have as Annette mom's question, like, why didn't you just call the FBI and say, Hey, I got a, I got a head in the mail, you know? So I think like that would have been the easy option out of this, but instead you chose to not only take on a journey, but make a film. And this calls back to Annette's point of like a voluntary journey versus an involuntary journey. And I think that that's the next thing that I would like for you to tell us about is like, what is it? What was the interest for you to tell this film through a journey, specifically your your journey, you know, and bringing this head into the context of, you know, the mythos of the West, of what history was and how, 
you know, like how it connects to us today, you know, and I think that that's really interesting that you inserted this journey and the journey is the story and it's personal. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I, you know, there's nothing, there's no sort of trope uh, that's more apropos of the American experience than the road trip. I yeah. mean, you know, that's sort of like a classic, you know, uh, you know, cinema, any, you, know, you know, narrative structure. And so, so once you have a physical journey, right, that becomes one layer of narrative. You're going from one place to another place, right? But then, so that gives you kind of like the architecture, but then what it really is, is it's a journey through time. Yeah. Right, because I'm tracing the same route that the early Anglo pioneers who immigrated to Mexico had gone, mm -hmm. right? So I'm tracing, I'm literally tracing the, the route of history, you know, into the past, okay? And so then that, then if you're tracing that route, then that's an opportunity then to explain, well, what was that route and what was that history, mm -hmm. right? But then all of that still doesn't quite work because you, it also, it has to be a journey to find out who Joaquin was. Yeah. Right, so that becomes another layer. Along the way, you're gonna have to learn a little bit about this guy until you come to some conclusion, build him up as a character. But then still that doesn't quite work as a narrative because why am I in the film except by happenstance, right? You need a better reason to be a character in a film than you just received the head. That's the starting point. But then the other part of it is, is that there has to be some relationship between you and the head, some kind of parallel where you have uh, you know, a relationship to Joaquin in some way. So I had to find are there ways of looking at things to where we're kind of connected? Yeah. And so along the way, I become kind of the mirror image of Joaquin. I'm, I'm the opposite of him. I have everything he didn't have. Mm -hmm. I have my head, he doesn't have his. He, his wife was raped and murdered. I have a wife, his home, his land was taken. I have a home. Um, all of the things that I'm able to be are all of the things that he could never be, mm -hmm. right? And so through learning that, then I have a narrative of my own um, realization yeah. and appreciation uh, for, you know, for, for the position that I have in life and that I'm sort of the, 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 the I, I could have been Joaquin except for I was born in a different moment sort of yeah. thing. Um, so yeah, you know, I mean, I think there, there are these multiple layers, but the physical journey becomes a metaphor for all of these yeah. other journeys as I've described. And each one of those layers has to have its own beginning, middle, and an end. And they all have to wrap up and coordinate by the end so that each thread is tied in a bow as the head is buried. Yeah. Right, so it's kind of like it's what it is. It's story craft. That's what mm -hmm. it is. It's story craft. It, the only difference between that and a fiction film is that you know I'm carving out of real life events, mm -hmm. and a fiction filmmaker would be carving out of uh, pure imagination. Yeah. But the key is is to make connections mm -hmm. that don't already exist. Mm -hmm. right that other people haven't quite made right because that's what creativity and innovation is is you're yeah. going to take these constellation of things and then you're going to connect things that normally would not connect in order to create something that's a new way of looking at something yeah does, does, does that make sense yeah totally yeah, yeah. It's, it's very layered and it's very complex and i think at the root of all of this is not only learning about history, but unraveling history. And that's something that I heard you say in another interview. It's sort of like, what do I get to wake up and, and, and learn today? What do I get to unravel? And it's not just, it's understanding that the process of history, it's not just something that you pick up a textbook and then you just know history because you read it, but it's sort of like, you have to find the silences of history as you know stated by my, Michael Roth Trulow. Um, it's 
reading in between the lines of history to find the things that were excluded from that history. And another thing that you said in an interview is that you wanna challenge the idea that Mexican Americans are outsiders to history. So I think that I really appreciate your journey in this because it's sort of, one, you're establishing that we're not outsiders to history. We are central to the history. And most importantly is that we're active participants in history. So I think that the work that you do is really interesting because instead of framing Joaquin Murieta as a mere victim, it's sort of like he wasn't just a victim. Yes, he was a victim, but there was a context much larger than him, you know, in the events that happened to him. So speaking of that, who was Joaquin Murieta? You know, like through all your research and, 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 and learning, like what have you been able to uncover of who the real Joaquin Murieta was or if there even was a Joaquin Murieta? And, and, and let me add to this too, because my family and I have been talking about your film. And, and one of the things my aunt asked me was, well, what did he know about Joaquin Murieta before he did the movie, right? Before he starts quest number one. Um, and, and to me, that was an interesting question, which is why I started my remarks with you saying, you know, connecting him to your family history. And so we were wondering, you know, did you grow up had you heard the corrido? Did you know that kind of Mexican, Mexican American version of Joaquin Murieta before you dove into this project? Okay, so two things like who was Joaquin and what did I know and when did I know it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Nixon here. Um, okay, so uh, 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 Joaquin, uh, about Joaquin, the, the man, I don't know. Mm -hmm. None of us knows. I mean, I, we, we don't even know if he really existed or not. Um, I, you know, I also went down to northern Mexico to this little village called Trincheras. Mm -hmm. We did some filming there because that's this purportedly the place that he was from. And people in that village will tell you Joaquin Morieta was from here. But I, I could find no baptismal records. I could find no birth certificate. I could find no death certificate. I could find no land grant of any kind. You know, nothing. So who knows? I mean, you know, you know, who knows? And, and in terms of Joaquin, so he's kind of, uh, he's a phantom of history, really. Yeah. Um, we know that there are events that surround this purported person and that are factual, but of him, I, you know, I don't know. And I, I'm not sure at this point we, you know, we will never know. I don't, I don't think we'll ever know. Um, and to a certain extent, it doesn't matter. Because as they, as they used to say, as, the, as Chicanos used to say in the 1960s, yo soy Joaquin, I am Joaquin. Mm -hmm. We are all Joaquin, mm -hmm. right? And well, what does that mean? It means number one, I belong here. This is my country too. And number two, I'm going to stand up for myself, right? right. And number three, um, you know, uh, you know, America has a problem. It's called a white problem. It's a problem with white people doing stuff, in this case, to Mexicans, which just isn't cool, man. It's just not cool. So, um, so you know, uh, uh, so all of those things I think rang true with me. Um, I, what did I know about Joaquin before I made the film? Well, I, I take after my good friend, uh, Bob Dylan, who once mm -hmm. said to me, um, I know my song well before I start singing. Mm -hmm. So before I pick up the camera, I've already ordered on Amazon every book that mentions either Joaquin or is written about the period in which he lived. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is about the way that people reacted uh, to his legacy and his idea. So, um, I mean, you, we're not in my office right now, but I just, books, mm -hmm. right? That's what we do. We read, we do deep, deep, deep research so that we, 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 we know what we're doing before we pick up the camera. Yes. So um, I had read, you know, drank up everything that I could find mm -hmm. um, 
about the early history of the West and Mexican Americans and, you know, you know, uh, you know, Carrie McWilliams, you know, you name it, right? Okay, so, um, uh, you know, so I felt like I knew the terrain really well and I knew it, uh, and I knew it well enough to know that what, what Joaquin really is, is he's kind of like a, a metaphor mm -hmm. for Mexican American people. Yeah. He symbolizes, um, you know, a dark history that uh, has been ignored and relegated to the ragged periphery of society. He also represents grievance and hope and opportunity and all of those things. And probably most of all for me, um, he represents, um, I guess, the Chicano equivalent of Pandora's box, mm -hmm. right? When you see at the beginning of the film, it kind of this box opens mm -hmm. and the head is in a box, mm -hmm. right? And it's almost like if you open up that box of history and if you see what's inside, what are you going to see exactly? Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to see death. You're going to see hatred, you know, you're going to see, um, uh, you know, discrimination, you're going to see violence and pestilence, right? You're going to see all of those things. You look at that severed human head, and what you see is you see the barbarism and the cruelty inherent in the human spirit, mm -hmm. what that is. But you also see hope, right? Yeah. What is the hope? The hope is, is that by acknowledging the past, that's the only way that you can have reconciliation and that you can move forward. You know, truth is a healing balm. Mm -hmm. You can't fight it. You just gotta accept that what happened, happened. Um, and you have to come to terms with it. And that's painful. And if I'm gonna uh, basically spend 28 minutes beating up on white people and telling them what screw ups they are, mm -hmm. okay? then um, if I'm going to do that, which I have no problem doing, then, um, then I better be clear that I'm going to hold myself and my own family mm -hmm. uh, and my own community to the same standard. Yeah. And, and, and what was clear is that um, before, uh, you know, uh, the Anglos uh, made us Americans in name only, mm -hmm. um, you know, many of us did the same thing to Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And so we, we are part of that uh, cycle yeah. and we're part of that. Uh, that's what makes us human. Yeah. We're, we're every bit as brutal and cruel and kind and loving and generous. Yeah. Uh, the Anglo counterparts, right? So that, you know, that kind of, to me, that's, that's what made the film worth making. Yeah. You know, is that it could transcend grievance, right? Um, I don't know, now I lost track of stuff. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because one of, one of the students asked the question, um, you know, like after you discover, you know, your family's past, um, you know, and, and it's not what maybe you thought it was or what you hoped it was. Um, when we go back all those generations, um, did, did you wish you, you didn't have that knowledge? Did you wish you, you'd been kept in the dark about that piece? Um, no, not this entitling Native no, no. peoples. Yeah, no, no. I am always on the side of truth. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, you know, yeah, I want to know. I want to know. I, I'm not. I don't believe in like living in la la land and telling yourself uh, fantasies. You know, I like. Uh, you know, I like knowledge. Yeah, drink it up. And um, and I want to know about uh, uh, you know you know you know the flaws in my own family history and the cruelty and the hatred and the injustice, because that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, and the higher the stakes, the more interesting the story is. So um, I'm all for that, and I never, you know, I never never want to make a film or tell a story that's hagiography. Or that, that that makes Chicanos or Mexican Americans or Latinos into some kind of perfect superheroes. Yeah, it's our it's our flaws that make us, you know, uh, both tragic and beautiful. Yeah. You know? And and if we're gonna and if we're gonna you know have a real conversation with our white 
colleagues and counterparts, then we have to have a real conversation with ourselves. Exactly. Well, it's only fair, it's only fair. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting because this is at, at the center of the twist that Annette alluded to at the beginning, which is you're finding out that your family were essentially conquistadors, you know, and that they acquired their land and their wealth at the expense of indigenous people. And I mean, that is a history that, that's the history of the Americas, you know, like the land dispossession of indigenous people and then like the subsequent gain um, not only by Spanish or by Anglo people, but also even by other indigenous people themselves. And I think that comes back to the point of what you were saying, which is that is the history of humans, like these cycles of conquest where we are able to forget our own past and move forward and then take advantage of someone else. And I think that ultimately as a creator, as a director, and as a historian, like we have to be very interested in, in the dismantling of nation building myths because nation building myths provide us a sanitized history that say like, oh, everything we did, we did because, you know, maybe we were selfishly human, but we wanted better for ourselves. But when this comes at the expense of other peoples and especially of entire groups, like, in this age of modernity and progress that we have all of this information available to us to not address those inequalities and those injustices would be to continue the inequalities and the injustices. So mm -hmm. I think for that reason, it's very interesting in, in how contextualizing history can help us rethink our own contemporary identities. So I wanted to know if you could speak a little bit about this interwoven relationship between lynchings and race? And what is it that you have discovered through your research that yeah. complicates our histories? So one thing real quick, I, so, so the word myth, mm -hmm. I think they're kind of like two meanings to it, at least in my mind. One meaning would be a myth is something that is not true. Mm -hmm. That's one meaning. However, um, I'm all for myths in the second sort of, you know, you, know, you, you know, sense, which would be a myth is something that becomes uh, 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 emblematic or symbolic of a, an individual or um, a people's journey and or aspiration or says something beyond the literal facts, okay? And so and I'm all for myth in that sense. Like, I don't think that, um, I don't think that we as humans can exist without myth. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, but, but the problem is, is, is it a myth that's, um, that's true or is it a myth that's fantasy, right? And so, um, so, 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 so I'm not against myth making. And in, in fact, I think, you know, all literature is kind of myth making and all good film, whether it's documentary or, you know, what you see in the theaters is myth making. And that myth making can reveal truth, um, you know, you know, through, the, you know, you, you know, through that process. So I'm not against myth per se. Mm -hmm. It's just, I'm against sort of, you know, twisted fantasy that tries to justify racial superiority. That that I have a problem yeah. with. <laughs> yeah. Just to be just to be clear. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I don't know. I don't know if that, you know, but whatever. So what was the so so you're talking about about lynching of Mexican Americans in the West and uh the, just the interwoven relationship between lynching and race, not necessarily just Mexican Americans. Well, well I, I'm not an expert in really, <laughs> okay? I'm a filmmaker. All I do is I'm a guy who runs around with the camera. Okay? Yeah. So I have no claim to secret knowledge or something. I have no PhD in mm -hmm. anything, right? However, this is what I would say. I'd say that lynching, almost by its very nature, is extra legal violence that targets uh, some kind of 
minority or somebody who's in some kind of an out group in some way. Lynching is about, um, well, really it's about power. It's about, it's about one people keeping another people in their place, right? So that's, you know, um, and it's not always racialized, but mostly it is. Um, in the American West, there were many uh, Mexican Americans who were lynched because of, say, witchcraft, and uh, and, and 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 you know Native Americans as well. Um, so sometimes it goes under the guise of these different things, you know, sexual, you know, being a sexual predator. So we're going to lynch the person, or you know, whatever. A lot of them have to do with, you know, sexuality, but it's also being a horse thief or, you know, those kinds of things. But those are just excuses to target people in another group, because if you really felt that somebody had committed a transgression, I mean, why not just take it to court? Yeah. You know, I mean, if you know that the person's guilty, then let's, you know, then let's have a full blown trial and let's, you know, figure out all the mitigating circumstances. Let's mm -hmm bottom of things let's find out what really happened and if the person's guilty then let's have it out in the open and then we will you know have you know some kind of justice but the reason you have a lynching is because you know you don't want the facts to come out <laughs> that's the whole point yeah. you know because dead men don't talk then the only story we know is the story of the you know of the of the guy who was in the lynch mob Mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's the entire, you know, point of the thing. Um, what was stunning for me is that, you know, um, in, you know, in proportion to their numbers, you know, African Americans in the South were lynched in proportionally very similar numbers to, you know, Mexicans in the West. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, it seems like the oxygen in the historical room is usually taken up by the lynching of African Americans. And there's good reason for this, because in terms of just raw numbers, more African Americans lynched, definitely. And in terms of when African Americans are lynched, a little bit closer to the modern period, right? So Mexican Americans were, were, had a smaller population, therefore the raw numbers are a little smaller. It's proportionally that they're the same. And it's also that Mexican Americans and Mexicans, right, tended to be lynched at a slightly earlier period than, uh, than African Americans. So we don't have as many images. Um, you know, we don't have like a lot of those postcards that people used to send when they would go to the lynching, right, et cetera. And so Mexican Americans tend to be, um, I don't know, that history tends to be glossed over or ignored or just simply denied. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and that's very damaging because it, yeah. you know, it's just a, it just creates a sort of a false narrative about, um, it, about how inequality yeah. uh, and unwind in the American West, you know? And, yeah. John, I wonder if you can tell us then about the central metaphor of burying the head, right? So, this, this sensibility um, that, that I really got at the end of the film, you, you've just talked about this, this sense of like, this is where we bring some closure. This is how we start to think through um, reconciliation, right? Through, through this truth finding and truth telling. Um, but then there's the metaphor of, of the bearing of the head, which is almost like getting rid of, of the unearthing you've just done. Um, and it, it reminds me, one of my neighbors always says, I'll, I'll bury the, I'll bury the hatchet, but I'll leave the handle sticking out, you know? Um, mm -hmm. so, so it's sort of this question for me is, is if you felt like there's, there's kind of a narrative closure there, if you felt like, you know, that you're being the person, you know, you as, um, a, a Mexican American person being the one to, to, to give Joaquin or, or the head of this person rest. If, if that has a narrative closure for you, um, if it does lead to some kind of reconciliation with the past. Yeah. So here's, here's I, I mean, I'll tell you how my mind works, okay? Hopefully it won't be too disappointing. <laughs> but so here's how my mind works. It's like, 
when I think about the head of Joaquin Morietta, the first thought that comes to my mind is, is that when people are not buried, their ghosts, you know, haunt the land. You know, I mean, I don't, where do I get that from? I, I have no idea. Okay, probably too many, you know, horror movies as a kid or something, right? So, but, you know, it's so, it's so, 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 so the West for me is like a haunted place. It's like a haunted house because it's not just that there's a severed head in the haunted house, it's that there are bodies like all over the place, mm -hmm. right? There are bodies at Porvenir. Right? There are bodies along the US-Mexico border in South Texas in the valley. There are bodies, there's, you know, the, you know, there are bodies in Santa Cruz and then, you know, the mission district in San Francisco, right? So um, it, there's, the, so the West is a haunted place. And so why is it haunted? It's haunted. Why does a ghost haunt a haunted house? Mm -hmm. Well, it's because something is left undone. Mm -hmm. Something is left unsaid. There was a great injustice that occurred and it hasn't been resolved so the spirit cannot rest, right? They're doomed to wander the earth. Um, and so how do you put that spirit to rest? So well, one thing is, a, is the physical act of burial and returning to the earth in a way that has dignity, okay? That's one aspect, but that's not enough. That's not enough. The story must be told, right? The story of what happened to those restless spirits, right? Their story must be told and they must be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so you have to tell the story of Joaquin and you have to acknowledge all of those who were lynched and you have to acknowledge that the land was taken before and tell the tale so that you can lay the spirit to rest. You know, without that, you, you, you know, you're just going to be in a, it continue to be in a haunted land. So metaphorically, you know, in a mythological sense, you know, that's what I was trying to do for Joaquin, for uh, Chicano people, you know, um, for myself, really, right? So that I could feel like I could lay that part of my own spirit, which is, restless and aggrieved, right? That I could lay that to rest for myself because when I'm burying Joaquin, what am I doing? I'm laying in the ground the, uh, the severed parts of my own history, right? Mm -hmm. It's this, when you cut somebody's head off, they're dismembered, mm -hmm. right? And now what I'm doing is I'm remembering. I'm re remembering, I'm recalling, putting it back together, creating memory, which makes things whole, which means you can lay it yeah. to rest. Dismember, remember, right? Yeah. So that's my, you know, so that's, you know, and, 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 and I've always had in my mind this notion from a, I don't, I, I don't know where I got this from, but the idea is, is that, you know, when you make a film, it, you know, it, you know, this is a good example, but could be any film that I've made. Mm -hmm. It's not really a film just for you or me or somebody else that we see, right? To a certain extent, what you're doing is you're creating these time capsules. Mm -hmm. You're saying, look, we were here. These things happened. You're telling a story about how we participated in creating this country, mm -hmm. in creating the industry, in creating art, in creating politics, in creating immigration, in changing the demographics of the nation, in changing the future of the country. We're not bystanders of history. We're the main event, baby. We're here, you know? And, um, and you take these time capsules and what you're really doing is you're lobbing them into the future to some unknown destination. Maybe it's five years, a hundred years, 200 years, a thousand years from now. But when we're long gone and we're resting with Joaquin, um, there will be people, those documents, those films will exist and they will say, look, here's the proof. You know, we created or helped create rock and roll music. Yeah. We, 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 we wrote these great books, you know, we tilled the fields, we fought in World War II, 
right? We fought for civil rights. We made this country a better place, not just for Mexican American people, but for all people. Mm -hmm. Because although we care about ourselves and our family, we care more about the legacy of human dignity and justice and freedom and equality. And we are part of that story. And that story would have never transpired had it not been for our activism and our thoughtfulness and our caring and our love. Yeah. Um, we, you know, this is this is our place too. And yeah. so that's you know in a sense that's the metaphor is to throw those things out there so that so that so that somebody a hundred years from now whatever is not in the same position that i was in when i was growing up and it may be that you may relate to this when i was growing up there were no films about mexican americans right yeah. when, when, when i tried to look through my grandparents photographs there were hardly any because they were too poor. They didn't have a camera, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? So the images didn't exist. It was like we'd been erased from history. We were phantoms of history in the same way that those people who were lynched in the American West became phantoms of history. Their stories untold and their spirits never resting because we're, we're, we're written out of the game. Yeah. And that is a lie. That is a lie. And so, um, and so it's trying to recapture that and, 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 and present the proof. And so, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, hopefully I have more films in me and we'll just keep making them. And it's, but it doesn't have to be a film. It can be somebody who writes poetry. It can be somebody who writes books or is a journalist who writes articles or, or, or you know, or an artist who paints pictures, whatever. We all contribute uh, to the cultural advancement of our nation in, in different ways in, with different expressions because we're all, we're all different. But that is the project. It's you know, recognition of diversity, equity, yeah. and inclusion for, for all of us. Yeah. I have no idea if I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, because I mean, but it also takes us to your whole, the whole breadth of your work. I mean, did you, did you, begin as a filmmaker thinking I am going to to document you know in in a dozen plus films you know the contributions of Latinx people I mean it's a it's a tremendous body of work um well it didn't start off that way uh but I'll so I'll just tell you a quick little story here so uh, so I when I got out of high school I went to the University of Washington in Seattle I did about a year and a half there, um, and then and then I dropped out. I mean, I was just I was bored. I wasn't inspired. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I mean, I loved school, but it just wasn't. I don't know. Something wasn't clicking. So uh, so I got a job working at a sub shop making submarine sandwiches. You know, um, and uh, and eventually uh, I got a job working um, as a uh, you know, teaching photography at a small rural village school in central India. Mm. I just wrote to them out of the blue. They didn't know who I was, but I told them, I said, listen, I, you know, I'm, I know photography and I would love to come there and teach. And I'd never taught anything. I didn't, you know, it was just a dumb, crazy notion. And they wrote back and they said, yeah, if you, if you, if you can get out here, um, we'll put you up, we'll, you know, we'll feed you, you know, et cetera, maybe give you a small stipend. So um, at that point, I, I had saved money from the sub shop. And I had, uh, at that time, you could get a one way ticket. And so as long as you went around the globe in one direction, you could go wherever you want until you got back to your point of origin. Uh -huh. I don't know if such a thing still exists. But, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so, so I did that and I went to New York for the first time. I'd never been away from home. I went to Paris, I went to Greece, um, I went to, to Israel, um, I went to Kuwait and I eventually ended up in, um, in India. I was like 19 years old, landed in India and I got to the place where I was supposed to be which is in Madhya Pradesh. It was a small rural village school right in the center of central India, very rural, very, like in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And one day my students came to me and they said, uh, 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 the people in the village, 
nearby have never met an American and they would like to meet you. Yeah. I was like, okay. And I said, so when do we go meet him? They said, now, let's, let's go. It was like seven o'clock in the evening. It was getting dark. So we walked through the jungle for about two kilometers and we come across this village and all the villagers had built a big bonfire and they'd pulled their, 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 their beds from out of their mud huts yeah. and motioned to us and we sat around the beds. And then they started speaking in Hindi. I didn't know what they were saying, but my students translated and they were telling me these myths about the gods and the goddesses about Hanuman and Ganesh and Shiva and Vishnu and Lakshmi and Ram. I have no idea what's going on. I don't know anything about Hinduism, but they're telling me these stories and I'm completely confused. And as the night was going on, I began to realize that each story was a little parable about what it is to lead a life well lived and what it is to lead a life squandered. And, 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 and so later that evening, we were walking back uh, to the school and it struck me and I began to think about the United States. And I thought about, well, what happened to our ability to gather around the communal fire and to relate to one another? And then it, as we're walking, I just, I had a realization. I was like, we do gather around the fire. Mm -hmm. We gather around a burning wall <laughs> and that burning wall is cinema. And we gather around a burning box and that burning box is television. And now we gather around these things, whatever this is, a computer or, or an iPhone or whatever. And it is through those fires that we tell the story of our people that we try to figure out what it is to lead a life well lived and what it is to lead a life squandered. That's it, those myths, those stories become the architecture of our national soul and our national aspiration. And I just thought, that's it. That's what I want to do. I, 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 I should tell the story of my people. Now, I had no idea what that meant. I, I was like, what does that mean? I have no, I don't even know. You know, <laughs> I have no clue. But I got back to the United States. I got a job working on a fishing boat in Alaska. You know, did you, you guys seen the deadliest catch of yours? Yeah, oh, I love that's great. That's really good. Um, binging. So, 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 I found out I get on the boat, I, I find out I get seasick. I'm the worst fisherman ever, it's horrible. But I, but because I was at in New York, I was at NYU, and I realized that they have a film program where you can study filmmaking. I, I never knew you could do such a thing, yeah. And so, I applied to film school, and then from from Alaska, then I flew straight to Manhattan to Greenwich Village and started film school there. So what, you know, so what is the thing? It's, it's not that you ever know exactly yeah. what you're doing, but it's that you're open to the possibilities of life and you're open to revelation as yeah. it is here, right? Yeah. And, and, and you're also open to the idea that, um, that what you do in your life is not just about you. Yeah. <laughs> community and um and it's not just about self-aggrandizement although hey i'm into making money as much as the next guy but that's not really what's important yeah. you know what's really important is um is 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 trying to sh help is to participate in the civic conversation of your community and your country for the yeah. better for the betterment of everyone so that you can leave the place, you know, a little bit better maybe than you found it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a great revelation, you know, because as content creators, as people who make things and think creatively, like we can either tell the same stories that have been told in the same point of view. And as we have been discussing, this point of view excludes us and minimizes our agency. So I think that that truly is the power of media, the power of film, television to, to reframe Latinx stories and to center not only Latinx stories, but everybody's stories, as you're saying, you know, and center everybody as humans who have stories to tell, who have feelings to share. And like, that's the beautiful thing because 
It is the differences in each other that make the spectrum of what it means to be human. It's not like, oh, we're all members of one race, the human race. So like, that's the only way that we can empathize with each other. But it's recognizing that as people from different ethnicities and different races, we're different. And that's okay, because these very differences are what should make us respect each other. So I, I find that to be a great revelation in, in, in utilizing media, not just to entertain, but also educate and to rethink these narratives. Yeah, and, and, and occasionally, once in a while, maybe even inspire. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. I think we're getting close to our end, but I just want to drive the point home and read this question from one of our audience, Haley Rafkin, and she asks, you say that Joaquin Murieta could be, quote, a legend of history. If he is in fact a myth, then it is not Joaquin's head that you buried. So who is it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> well, you know, so it, it, for that, I'll have to tell you a little story, right? Mm -hmm. And this is something that wasn't in the film, okay? Um, although it probably should have been, but eh, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, when the California Rangers went out hunting for Joaquin, right? They had no, you know, they, 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 this, this was pre-photography. There was no photograph of this guy, Joaquin, okay? So, and anybody who had seen him up close was dead. Mm -hmm. They had no idea who they were looking for, really. So Joaquin, in a way, becomes a metaphor right away because any Mexican could be Joaquin, right? It could be anybody. All Mexicans, in a sense, were Joaquin, right? They were all criminals. They were all revolutionaries. They were all troublemakers, right? Mm -hmm. and so they, they went around. So they, 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 after you know some period of time, I think it was about three months, they returned to Sacramento to see Governor John Bigler, um, and they brought this severed human head and they said, we got the guy and they were given the money. And then they traveled around Northern California displaying the head. And what ended up happening is that ushered in, in a, you know, a period of ethnic cleansing throughout California. The Mexicans fled the gold fields and they fled for their lives. Okay. And so for safety, they went to form like little communities where they could kind of like band together, you know, with their numbers for protection. So they went to places like Santa Barbara, like Santa Cruz, the Mission District in San Francisco. They went to places like East LA. So the modern vadios of Mexican Americans in the United States, in many cases, really grow out of the ethnic cleansing of Mexicans out of the gold fields in California. Mm -hmm. That's how we got those varios that we, that we have today in large measure. So when they were done with the head, the, uh, the California Rangers, the guy, the head Rangers guy, his name was Harry Love. Sounds like somebody out of a 1970s porn film. Anyway, so he goes, so Harry Love, right, goes and he sells the head in San Francisco to this place called Dr. Jordan's Pacific Museum of Anatomy and Science. Mm -hmm. And he sells it to them and they put it on display. And what, what Dr. Jordan's museum was, is it was kind of a Ripley's believe it or not, but with mm -hmm. real stuff, mm -hmm. okay? So they have the head and right next to it was a deformed fetus in a jar called the Cyclops Child. And next to that, there was a stuffed three-legged chicken. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, a huge display on the ravages of venereal disease. Mm -hmm. And so it was this place where people would pay this money to see kind of like these freakish artifacts of natural history, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so then what happens 19, you know, 19, the, the, the 20th century happens and then boom, the San Francisco earthquake. Okay, levels the city, including Dr. Jordan's Pacific Museum of Anatomy and Science, and the place is completely destroyed. All of the artifacts, I mean, the three-legged chicken, unfortunately, is not with us anymore, right? The Cyclops child, 
no more, right? And along with it, the head of Joaquin Moriata, as far as we know, or the head or whoever's head that they that the California Rangers decided to grab and just murder so that they could get the reward money, which is really what probably happened. So the provenance of the head ends right there at Dr. Jordan's museum in the San Francisco earthquake. So what about the head that's in the film? So we know that it cannot, first of all, we know that nobody got Joaquin Murrieta's head because th th there may not even have been a Joaquin Murrieta. There's probably just some mm -hmm. Mexican. Number two, we know that the Mexican, or maybe it wasn't even a Mexican, who knows? Maybe they grabbed some Indian guy. I don't know, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so then the Dr. Jordan's is destroyed. So the original head is gone. So what does that leave us with? Well, I, you know, well, I didn't open up the jar, you know, and stick my hand in, okay? <laughs> I didn't get a DNA test, but if you, but after is seeing the thing up close, 19th century glass is like, kind of like wavy. Mm -hmm. This glass was not wavy. It was from a more modern vintage, okay? Um, the, the top of the, and you can see it in the film, the top lid is held together by duct tape. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure that it's not 19th century duct tape. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but most of the it's in the film, but you don't notice it because you're thinking about the head and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, I, you know, I can't say for certain, here's what I would 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 if I were a betting man, this is what I would what I would say. I would I'd probably my assumption would be that this is some kind of facsimile that was created um, in the years after Dr. Jordan's was destroyed. Uh, how long after? I mean, I you know who knows, but but it's probably a, a, a facsimile, whether of wax or plastic or rubber or something. I mean, I'm not sure. Um, and so it's really a, 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 a symbol of that violence rather than being uh, a cadaver, you know. Um, but here's the thing. Um, you watch the film and, you know, we have a couple of teases, you know, Carlos, you know, looks at the head, right? Um, and, uh, and then uh, Dulcinea looks at the head, right? And um, so at the very end, it's like, you gotta have the reveal. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody who's watched reality television, you know, you gotta have the reveal. So you're gonna have to show the head. And I thought to myself, that's really, really, really important because whether the head is an authentic human cadaver or not, it's really captures a sense of the brutality of history. Yeah. And, and I felt like it's very important for the audience to bear witness to that. Because I know this, whether it's one year or 10 years or 30 years from now, everybody who watches that film, they will remember that they saw that head. Mm -hmm. They will know that that really happened to somebody. Mm -hmm. right? And that will stick with them for the rest of their life. That hit will be ingrained in their mind and they will never forget it. Mm -hmm. And um, if you know nothing about American history, if you remember that head, I think you kind of, uh, I think you're gonna keep things in perspective. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's important, it's important. But is it a dead human? Uh, I don't know, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bet the house on it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean ultimately narratives like these help us rethink that help us move past all of these violences never get over them because i feel like we can't forget but we can try to forge new paths to you know to a society where you know it may be utopic but hopefully one day we get there where everybody is you know <laughs> equal or same or or they don't have to worry about these violences or these oppressions 
or or but, at least as, as John is saying, it's like there these things are horrific rather than you know accepted, right? And because I, I think that's one of the things that the film's doing. And I know that 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 we're out of time, but but that's one of the things that the film does. And as you're saying, that reveal does is it it reminds you, you know that that there that this is a horror this is a yeah. trauma this is a violence right it's not a it's not a dime store curiosity mm -hmm. yeah 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 and it shows you uh what we are capable of yeah you know, we, you know listen uh if you're not conscientious and if you're not careful uh there will be other heads chopped off you know there will be uh you know uh, uh people uh murdered by police officers that's being filmed and broadcast live on television. There will be children who are separated from their families and are put into cages and then made orphans for the rest of their life. Yeah. Okay. Uh, people will go to prison and will go to death row. And then after we've killed them, we will find out that they're innocent. Yeah. These things will happen. Now, the, the question is, is are we going to be cognizant of that history and are we going to work for a more just and humane world where we, you know, reduce those things from happening? Or are we going to embrace those things and revel in it and revel in the madness? Right. And, um, you know, that's something that we as a society and a culture have to decide what's, what side of history do we stand on right right and i think this is a perfect place to end i want to thank everybody for joining us today and i want to thank john for speaking to us about his film uh we will be having more screenings and more conversations in the future so please stay tuned um thank you so much for your participation and your questions and again, th John, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Be safe and peace. Take care. Right. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Take care.